it's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause well more than a year since Alison Thulis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. The UK government have never been able to justify this policy and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the, drum, the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. If you enjoy watching our programmes, please help us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster by signing up to become a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. committed to. The resources available, the time has been available. I'm only sorry the Welsh Government have not reacted to build that road after the calls of the Honourable Mayor. Grateful to Mr Matheson. Speaker, business growth in North Wales is being choked off by congestion on the M56 on my side of the border. Will the Secretary of State sit down with the Transport Secretary to work out when this is going to be upgraded? Stay. Member makes an important point, and I regularly discuss this issue with the uh, or these issues uh, with the Secretary of State, my honourable friend, the Secretary of State uh, for Transport. He has brought together a working group that involves officials and ministers from all parts of the United Kingdom in relation to cross-border issues. Uh, I was only disappointed the Welsh Government didn't attend the last time we met. Mr. David Jones, Mr. Speaker, businesses across North Wales were delighted with the Chancellor's budget announcement of £120 million pounds worth of funding for the North Wales Growth Deal. However, that, that announcement has not been followed by a similar announcement from the Welsh Assembly Government. Is my uh, right honourable friend able to say when such an announcement might be expected? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm grateful to my, my right honourable friend for highlighting uh, this important policy. The North Wales Growth Deal has been taking some time to negotiate, but my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, as he rightly pointed out, announced £120 million at the budget. We're working closely with the Welsh Government to encourage them to uh, follow the same lines of, uh, of commitment, uh, and on Friday there are further meetings to seek to crystallise this. Thank you. Order. I want to invite the House to join me today in warmly welcoming to the gallery a quite extraordinarily brave and courageous rape victim who has waived her anonymity in order to campaign not merely for her rights, very important though those rights Are, but for the rights of all women similarly violated. I'm referring, of course, to Sammy Woodhouse. Welcome to the House of Commons, Sammy. <laughs> Questions to the Prime Minister, Mr. Philip Dunn. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, first of all, join you and the whole House in commending Sammy Woodhouse? It is, I think we all recognise across this House that for too long it has been difficult for rape victims to speak out 
I hope that now, following her example, others will recognise that they will be heard and that proper action will be taken. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Philip Dunn. Speaker, could I echo yours and the Prime Minister's comments in respect of uh, Sammy Woodhouse from these back benches? Does my right honourable friend believe that today's announcement of the UK life sciences sector's significant investment uh, to work alongside the NHS using genomics and AI to help diagnose major diseases early shows that world-class life sciences companies such as Agilent in my constituency will continue to invest in the UK to help the NHS improve patient outcomes post-Brexit. Well, the Prime can, I, Minister. can I say to uh, my honourable friend that uh, this investment is indeed a significant one. £1 billion investment. It will deliver a state-of-the-art research and development facility in the UK. It will support 650 jobs. It's absolutely right that this does show the opportunities available to the UK post-Brexit. It also shows the advantage of our industrial strategy with AI right at the heart of that and, and recognising the importance of AI in the uh, health sector in the future. This is a, a a, a very significant investment. It will support jobs in the UK. It will support other employment in the UK and our economy in the future. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, I join yourself and the Prime Minister in welcoming Sammy Woodhouse to Parliament today. And it's a typical act of your generosity to refer to her in the gallery today so that other Others may be emboldened to deal with the horrors of the rape crisis that we face. Mr Speaker, I'd also like to express our sympathies to the family of Luke Griffin from Merseyside, who was killed in Kabul last week alongside five fellow G4S workers who were Afghan nationals. Luke had previously served in the 16th Regiment of the Royal Artillery. Mr Speaker, while we debate the critical issue of Brexit... We must not neglect the crisis facing millions of people across our country. Last week, I wrote to the Prime Minister about the scathing report of the UN Special Rapporteur on this government's brutal policies towards the poorest in Britain. As of now, I have received no reply from the Prime Minister. But when the Prime Minister read the report, what shocked her more? Was it the words the UN used, or was it the shocking reality of rising poverty in Britain. Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman, and we have been clear, as my right honourable friend, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions has been, that we don't agree with this report because what we actually see No, I don't agree with this report. What we actually see in our country today is absolute poverty at record lows. More, peop- more people in work than ever before, youth unemployment almost halved, wages growing, and that's because of the balanced approach that we take to our economy, a Conservative government delivering for the British people. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, it could be that she doesn't agree with it because it's an unpalatable truth that's in yes. that report. Yes. The new Work and Pensions Secretary seems to have taken a lesson from her and created a hostile environment for those that are claiming benefits. One one of the government's policies that's causing the greatest anxiety and poverty is universal credit. The UN Rapporteur, Professor Alston, said it was fast falling into universal discredit. When will the Prime Minister demonstrate some of her professed concern about burning injustices and halt the rollout of universal credit. Prime Minister. No, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we've exchanged on this issue of universal credit before. Universal credit. You, oh, the, the, the Shadow Foreign Secretary from a sedentary position says we've not done anything about it. What we have done as we have been rolling out universal credit is making changes as we have gone through those changes. But actually, I'm afraid... I'm afraid that what we saw was a Labour Party that wouldn't support the changes we were making to universal credit. 
So we've listened and we've made changes. It's time actually that the Labour Party recognise that the universal credit is ensuring that we see more people in work in this country, that we see absolute poverty at record lows. And that's it, a system that delivers for people, encourages them into work, a simpler system that's better for those people who need to use it. Jeremy Corbyn, uh, she might just care to cast her eyes over the report from the Trussell Trust. And I quote, if the five-week wait isn't reduced, the only way to stop even more people being forced into food banks this winter will be to pause all new claims to universal credit. The UN also called for the five-week wait to be scrapped. In the coming weeks, universal credit is being rolled out in Anglesey, Blackpool, Milton Keynes, parts of Liverpool, parts of London and Glasgow. People risk being left with no money at Christmas. If the Prime Minister won't halt... If the Prime Minister won't halt the rollout of universal credit, will she at least immediately, immediately end the five-week wait? Prime Minister! Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that he doesn't quite seem to understand how the system actually operates? No one, no one has to wait for money if they need it. We've made advances... Uh, We're less than a third of the way through, and already there's too much noise on both sides of the House. Members must calm themselves. The questions will be heard, however long it takes, and the same is true of the replies. Please try to get used to that. The Prime Minister. No one needs to wait for their money if they need it. We have made it easier for people to get advances. We've ensured they can get 100% 100% of their first month's payment up front. And we've already already scrapped the seven-day waiting period. And as I repeat, what happened when we scrapped the seven-day waiting period? Labour voted against it. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker... It's a loan that's offered for some people. And the Trussell Trust has pointed out that food banks... The Trussell Trust has also pointed out that food banks face record demand this December. I just gently say to her and the members behind her, food banks are not just a photo opportunity for Conservative MPs. Who themselves... All of whom supported, all of whom supported the cuts in benefit that have led to the poverty in this country. Yeah. Yesterday, the Joseph Roundry Foundation research found, and I quote, "In work poverty was rising faster than the overall employment rate yeah. due to chronic low pay and insecure work." The United Kingdom has the weak. Weakest wage growth of all G20 nations. Living standards have fallen for the majority of people. What is so wrong with our economy that our pay growth is so much worse than each of the other nations in the G20? Prime Minister. Right, honourable gentlemen, that we have, we now see wages growing faster than they have for nearly a decade. We see employment. We see employment at record levels. But what the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to do, he talks about scrapping universal credit. What he wants to do is to go back to square one. That means going back to a system that left 1.4 million people spending more, most of a decade trapped on benefits. It left people, it left people paying an effective tax rate of 90%. And it cost every household an extra £3,000 a year. As ever with Labour, it was ordinary working people who paid the price. Mr Speaker, the Chief Economist of the Bank of England describes the last decade as a lost decade for wages. And, well, the Prime Minister might laugh at this. It's the reality of people's lives. It's the re- order, 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 order. I appeal to members making too much noise to stop doing so. And I order. And I say very gently to 
the junior minister on the back bench who is making far too much noise, but is ordinarily a good-natured and genial chap. I'm referring to the honourable gentleman, the member for Hexham. You can do, Mr. Opperman, you can do order. You can do so much better. Try to be a well-behaved citizen today. Well, possibly like some others, but, but there are quite a lot of badly behaved people. Try to set a better example, Mr Opperman. You're a Minister of the Crown. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two years ago, a United Nations committee found this government's policies towards disabled people represented a grave and systematic violation of their rights. Does the Prime Minister think that situation has improved in the past two years? Prime Minister. I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, first of all, in answer to the, the uh, latter point that he's made, it's this government that has a key commitment in relation to getting disabled, helping disabled people get into the workplace. There are too many disabled people who have felt that they have not been able to do what they want to do, of actually getting into the workplace, earning an income for themselves and their families. And it's this government that is helping. And the former Secretary of State for Work and Pes- Pensions, uh, uh, through the... the uh, arrangements that she put in place to ensure the disability confident arrangements that she put in place are doing exactly that. But he started off his, he started off his comments by talking, referencing the last decade. Yes, the last decade have meant that difficult decisions have had to be taken. But why did those difficult decisions have to be taken? They were taken, they were taken because of the Labour Party's mismanagement of the economy. Remember, remember the letter from the Right Honourable Member for Birmingham Hodge Hill. Under Labour, there is no money left. Mr Speaker, when I hear a Prime Minister talking about difficult decisions, what always happens afterwards in these contexts is the the poorest lose out in our society. 4.3 million disabled people are now in poverty. 50,000 were hit by appalling cuts to the Employment Support Allowance benefit alone last year. This government labelled disabled people scroungers. It called those unable to work skivers. It created... It created a hospital... Order, Carl. Order. I don't need any advice from the Home Secretary. He should seek to discharge his own obligations in his office to the best of his ability. I require no advice from the Right Honourable Gentleman on the discharge of mine. Be clear about that. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This Government also created a hostile environment. Mr Speaker, this this government created a hostile environment for the Windrush generation. When the UN rapporteur said British compassion for those who are suffering has been replaced by a punitive, mean-spirited and callous approach, he couldn't have summed up this contemptible government any better. Child poverty is rising. Homelessness, rising. Destitution, rising. Household debt, rising. When will the Prime Minister turn her warm words into action, end the benefit freeze, repeal the bedroom tax, scrap the two-child cap and halt the rollout of universal credit? Prime Minister! The the Right Honourable Gentleman referred to the poorest losing out. I'll tell him when the poorest lose out. It's when a Labour government comes in. It's It's a... Order! 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 The finger-pointing and yelling and braying must stop. I understand that passions are running highly, but on both sides of the House, we need to have some sense of decorum. The Prime Minister. It's when a Labour government comes in. What this government has done, we've introduced the national living wage. Conservatives, not Labour. We've taken taken millions of people out of paying tax altogether. Conservatives, not Labour. 
Under this government, 3.3 million jobs have been created. Every Labour government leaves office with unemployment higher than when it went into office. So what do we see under this government? Our economy is growing, employment is rising, investment is up. We are giving the NHS the biggest single cash boost in its history. Taxes are being cut. Wages are rising. Labour would destroy all that. It is this Conservative government that is building a brighter future for our country. Mr Speaker, as my right honourable friend knows, none of us look forward to a smear test, but it can make the difference between life and death. Worryingly, nearly a third of women are missing out on cervical screening. Can I ask my right honourable friend what steps she and her government are taking to make sure more women get tested and don't suffer the terrible consequences of picking up cancer too yeah, late? Yeah, yeah. Well, can I Prime Minister, my friend, I'm grateful to her for raising what is an important point, and we do need recognise that we need to do more to encourage women to undertake cervical screening tests. Uh, in October, we announced a package of measures which will be rolled out across the country, which has the aim of uh, seeing three quarters of all cancers detected at an early stage by 2028. And this will see radically, uh, a radical overhaul of the screening programmes, and it will be made more accessible and easier to use. But I just want to give this very simple message, and I am able to do this standing at this dispatch box. Smear tests are not nice. All those of us who have had smear tests recognise they are not nice. But they are important. They, if you want to see cancer detected early, have your smear test. A few minutes of discomfort could be saving your life. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank you for your remarks of welcome to Sammy Woodhouse, a very brave woman who has done the right thing in waiving her anonymity. We must all call out crimes of sexual violence, those responsible must be held to account. Mr Speaker, we were promised strong and stable. What we have is a government in crisis, a government that has lost two Brexit secretaries, a Home Secretary, a Foreign Secretary, a Work and Pension Secretary, a government that has suffered from three consecutive defeats in just two hours. The first government to do so, Mr Speaker, in 40 years. And now a government found to be in contempt to Parliament. Is it time that the Prime Minister took responsibility, a responsibility for concealing the facts on her Brexit deal from members in this House and the public? Will she take responsibility? Prime Minister. He is absolutely wrong about that. We have not concealed the facts on the Brexit deal from members of this House. What he will see is that the legal position that was set out on Monday in the 34 page document, together with the statement made and the answers to questions given by the Attorney General on Monday, very clearly set out the legal position. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, that is an incredibly disappointing response from the Prime Minister. The facts have had to be dragged out of this government by Parliament. Mr Speaker, this morning we have seen the detail of the illegal advice. We have seen the facts that the government tried to hide. Mr Speaker, this government is giving Northern Ireland permanent membership of the single market and the customs union. The legal advice is clear. It states, despite statements in the protocol that is not intended to be permanent, in international law, the protocol would endure indefinitely. Since the Prime Minister returned from Brussels with her deal, the Prime Minister has been misleading the House inadvertently or otherwise. The Prime Minister must explain... Order! 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 There can be no suggestion of otherwise. The right honourable gentleman must make it clear that there is no suggestion that the government is misleading the House deliberately. There can be no question of that. If the right honourable gentleman wants to use the word inadvertently, which people do now and again, he can, but there must be no ambiguity on the point. And I ask the right honourable gentleman to clarify that matter and to order, order. No, no, I don't need any advice from anyone. I know exactly what I'm doing, and the right honourable gentleman must comply. Mr Ian Blackford. 
Mr Speaker, I did use the word inadvertently and I repeat it, that since the Prime Minister has returned from Brussels with her deal, the Prime Minister has been misleading the House, perhaps inadvertently. The Prime Minister... The Prime Minister... Order, order, order. Order, 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 order. I always want the Right Honourable Gentleman to be heard fully, and he will be. But there can be no imputation of dishonour, and the insertion of the word perhaps suggests the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to keep his options open. The option of imputing dishonour does not exist. That word must now be removed. Please rephrase, continue, and complete briefly. Mr. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, I, I say again inadvertently. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister must explain. The Prime Minister must explain why she continues to deny Scotland the rights and opportunities that her deal offers to other parts of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Minister, I say to the right honourable gentleman that I think what he will see if he makes a careful analysis of the statement that the Attorney General made in his answer to questions on Monday and of the legal position that was set out by the Government, uh, in many ways unprecedented that the Government actually published such a 34-page document, he will see, he will see that the advice, the advice that he is holding in his left hand has no difference from the uh, statement that was given. Indeed, indeed, I might take up the personal challenge from the Right Honourable Gentleman. I have myself said on the floor of this House that there is indeed no unilateral right to pull out of the backstop. What I have also said is it is not the intention of either party that the backstop should A, be used in the first place, or should B, if it is used, should be anything other than temporary. And he, find, he finishes off by saying once again that he wants to, uh, wants to look to what Scotland should have from the deal. We are leaving the European Union as the whole United Kingdom. We will negotiate as the whole United Kingdom for the interests of Scotland, for the interests of Scotland remaining in the internal market of the United Kingdom is the most important economic interest. And for the interest of Scotland coming out of the common fisheries policy, which is in our deal and our policy and not his. Gordon Henderson. Uh, Mr Speaker, my local authority, Swale Borough Council, is being asked to find land for thousands more homes. And my constituents in City Morna Sheppey are not happy. Over the past 20 years, we've seen large-scale housing developments that have transformed our area. We feel we have already accepted more than our fair share of new housing. So will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, urge her ministers to take steps to reduce the housing targets being imposed on Swale? A minister. Can I say to my honourable friend, I, I absolutely recognise uh, the concern that he raises and the fact that often people are concerned when they see proposals for new development in their areas. But we do need to build the home. Ladder. There are young people today who worry that they will not be able to get onto the housing ladder, and I'm sure my honourable friend shares my determination to ensure that they are able to do so. And I'm pleased to say that in the last year we've delivered over 222,000 new homes, the highest level we've seen in all but one of the last 30 to discuss his local issue uh, further. Stuart Hosey. Yeah. Every single Brexit scenario this government have modelled shows GDP growth to fall. Yeah. And to fall further when the impact of ending freedom of movement yeah. is yeah. factored yeah. in. Yeah. This Prime Minister continues to pretend ending free movement is a good thing, it is a bad thing. Yeah. So let me ask her. Why is she prepared to take from our children and grandchildren the ability to travel freely throughout Europe? And why is she doing it in a way which is economically illiterate? Yeah. Prime Minister! 
what, uh, what the analysis actually shows is that outside of the European Union, the best deal available in relation to our economy, which delivers on leaving the European Union, is the deal that is on the table, is the deal that I have negotiated with the European Union. When people, voted, when people voted to leave the European Union, one of the issues they voted on was bringing an end to free movement once and for all. And that is what this government will deliver. Alex Chalk! In its November survey, local homelessness charity P3 recorded that there were two rough sleepers in Cheltenham. Two too many, of course, but a dramatic reduction on the previous year. Does my right honourable friend agree that this shows the value of social impact <coughs> bonds which provide vital one-on-one -on -one support to people with complex needs? And will she su support and congratulate the vital work of charities CCP and P3 who make such a difference to vulnerable people in our community? Yeah. Prime Minister! Can I, can I say to my honourable friend that he raises a very important issue, and yet we are all concerned about the question of rough sleepers. But as he says, it's about finding the solutions and the ways through that is important. And I'd like to commend him for the excellent work he's been doing and campaigning on these issues on homelessness, rough sleeping and social impact bonds. And I'd like to congratulate P3 and CCP in Cheltenham. I think the rough sleeping social impact bond, which is designed to support individuals who've spent a long time within the homelessness system and to reduce rough sleeping in the long term by helping them to access the support and services they need, is a very important step forward. And I congratulate those organisations for the work they've done in his constituency. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Point six of the attorney's legal advice shows that the Prime Minister has not only breached her red lines on the single market, but also on customs. Doesn't it mean it's even less likely that her deal will pass through this House? Constitutionally, that should mean a general election. But if not, isn't there a way to resolve this, to have a public vote on her deal? Why can't she see that, and why can't she say that? Prime Minister! Can I say, if the... the Right Honourable General looks at the arrangements that we have uh, in place for the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. It is clear that we will not be in the single market and we will not be in the customs union. What we will have, what we will have is an ambitious trade agreement which enables us to uh, reduce those, and, and we will continue to uh, work for frictionless trade at the border. It is an ambitious trade agreement, unlike any other that has been given to any other advanced economy. It is the most ambitious trade agreement that any advanced economy has with the European Union. That is good for this country, and it is good for jobs in his constituency. This is Pauline Latham. All young people have to stay in educational training until they are 18 now. Isn't it time we raised the age of marriage in this country from 16 to 18, as we ask other countries to do. Prime Minister. Uh, honourable friend, I think the numbers of people who are marrying in England and Wales at 16 or 17 are very small and actually continue to decline. Uh, we have not seen any evidence of failings in the existing protections for people to marry in England and Wales at 16 or 18 with the appropriate consents, but we do continue to keep this under review. And my noble, my noble friend, the Baroness Williams, said uh, back in September that we will look at whether there is any link between parents giving consent when girls are aged 16 or 17 and instances of forced marriage, if that is one of the concerns, that, that may be one of the concerns behind uh, the point that my honourable friend is making. So we will specifically look at that issue. McGovern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In March 2017, the Prime Minister knows that New Ferry in my constituency was devastated by a huge explosion and many people injured. I raised this with her at Prime Minister's Questions. And Mr Speaker, she said that the community would get support to recover. After 18 months of struggling, her Secretary of State has now written to me to say that New Ferry will get no such support from her government. So was I wrong, Mr Speaker, to take her at her word? Or were my constituents right when they said when it comes to helping people, you can never trust the Tories? Prime Minister... I say to the Honourable Lady, I think she knows, she knows of incidents when people have been able in her region to trust the Tories. And she knows what. Let's look at the explosion in New Ferry. Let's look at the explosion in New Ferry. It was clearly devastating. It clearly impacted both residents and businesses. And I did, as she said, made a commitment to look at it. Now, I will look at the uh, letter that she has received from the Secretary of State. 
because my understanding was that the MHCLG, the Ministry, was encouraging Wirral Council to apply for a range of funding streams, yeah. Yeah. including uh, uh, various sums of money that would have been available, and that they had asked Homes England to work with the Council and had made on their regeneration plans and had made money available in response to that. But I will certainly look at the letter she refers to. Charles Walker. Mr Speaker, I do rise from the naughty corner, so I might need your protection. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend for her determined campaigning in the area of mental health, both as Home Secretary and now as Prime Minister? And will she join me in congratulating Sir Simon Wesley, who has just done a review of the Mental Health Act, his findings will be published tomorrow. So Simon conducted this review with great good humour, great good humour, with compassion and dignity. Yeah, yeah. And even though this House is so divided on so many issues, it should be united on this report. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I say to my honourable friend, I think he's absolutely right. I hope that this issue of mental health and how we look at the Mental Health Act is an important question that will unite people across this House with a recognition that we have been right to have this review. And I certainly, uh, I'm certainly happy to congratulate Professor Sir Simon Wesley on the work that he's done. He's engaged with a wide range and a large number of service users and their families, as well as health organisations and professionals, to help shape his recommendations. I certainly look forward to reading them, and we will bring, obviously, commit as a government to come forward with uh, legislation in due course. This is an important area. We should all get behind this. As the Dunray nuclear site in my constituency continues to decommission, the issue of high-quality replacement jobs is hugely important. In fact, it's crucial. Therefore, I welcome Her Majesty's Government's decision to locate the UK's first vertical takeoff rocket launch site in the north of my constituency. I give credit where it is due, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister, ensure that the maximum number of jobs arising from this site will be located locally in North Sutherland and Caithness and not somewhere much further south. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I thank him for his remarks about the Government's decision. Uh, this is a, an exciting opportunity for the United Kingdom to be taking a leading role in the new commercial space age. And uh, obviously he's referenced the new spaceport and, and the ambition that we have there. I, think, I, I understand that following a positive report by the local Crofters Association, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is moving ahead with their plans, which could create 40 skilled jobs locally in spaceport construction and operation. And uh, I, I recognise the uh, importance of the skilled jobs that he's talking about locally. I think this is a real opportunity for his constituent technology. Sir William Cash. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the motion that was passed yesterday relates... to the Attorney General clause, ECJ jurisdiction, the incompatibility of the uh, agreement with the repeal of the 72 Act, and matters of seminal importance to deciding this question. Prime Minister. To the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman, that uh, I suggest he looks at the remarks that were made uh, in this chamber yesterday following the Government's announcement that it would changes were made, and those changes would be made in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, which will be brought before Parliament. Mrs Sharon Hodgson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister may recall that last week I asked her about the terrible funding settlement for Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue Service. Well, I was not happy with the answer, so I'm going to try again. In light of the fact that, the funding, that funding local services, such as police and fire, through the council tax precept, just doesn't work in areas such as mine. Yeah, yeah. Will she right. look again at this funding <coughs> formula that is going to leave areas such as mine perilously close to being an unsafe service in fire and police yeah. very soon? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, understand, I understand that in Home Office Orals earlier this week, the police and fire minister uh, undertook to get back to the Honourable Lady. But, I might, uh, uh, but as I think my right Honourable Friend, the Fire Minister, made clear this week, the authorities' core spending power has increased this year. I am also informed that Tyne and Weir hold £25 million of reserves, 
which is equivalent to 52 days of rail strike action, despite the Transport Secretary's assurance that the guards on the Cumbrian coastal line will remain. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, condemn the actions of RMT, which have left vulnerable people without public transport yeah, 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 yeah. and businesses suffering yeah, in the run up to Christmas? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. But can I say to my honourable friend that I do indeed uh, condemn the action that has been taken by RMT, which, as she says, is leading to people and businesses <coughs> suffering as a result. And we're calling on RMT to end these strikes. They've been guaranteed jobs beyond this franchise. There is no need, there is no reason to continue this needless action. And the message is very clear. Stop the strikes, get round the table and put passengers first. Julie Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Ofsted report that 1.3 million children with special educational needs are not getting those needs yeah, met in school, enough. and over 2,000 children on EHC plans in 2018 received no support yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Ambitious, yeah. Ambitious, yeah. ambitious for Autism report that there's been an increase of 60% over the last four years in yeah. autistic children being excluded from school. Yeah. Today, can I ask the Prime Minister to look, please look beyond those figures, to the children and affected yeah. and the distress that they and their parents are experiencing yeah. and would she agree with me that this is a national scandal that yeah. needs to be addressed with the utmost urgency yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady every child, every child deserves the right education every child deserves the right education for them and we are working up to drive up the quality for children with special educational needs and those with disabilities as well and we've taken a number of steps we've introduced a new inspections framework more focused on local area strengths and weaknesses, and we're working to spread best practice. There are some areas where this is dealt with in a better way than in others. And when used properly, the health, education, health and care plans do ensure support is tailored to the needs of children, and families are put at the heart of the, pro of the process, and more money is going in this year towards children with special education needs. But I recognise I recognise that often there are parents of children with special educational needs who feel that they are constantly having to you know, beat their head against the, the bureaucracy that they come up with in order to ensure that they get the right support for their children. We are committed to ensuring that we are delivering for children and we are delivering for quality education that is right for children with special educational needs. In Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I know how much the Prime Minister likes to get out on the doorsteps of her constituency every time she's able to, as I do. Does she, like me, find that people are raising with her the issue of potholes on a regular basis? And does she, like me, welcome the fact that we are spending £6.7 million? What uh, happens in my constituency as well? I want to hear about the pothole situation. You know, in Redditch and elsewhere, absolutely. Rachel McLean. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The roads in Redditch are excellent on the whole, but we are very pleased to be awarded £6.7 million worth of the funding across Worcestershire in the recent budget. How quickly does the Prime Minister think this money will be spent fixing our roads? Well, yeah. Prime Minister! Can I say to my honourable friend, she does indeed raise an important issue. Potholes and local services and uh, issues that matter on pe for people on a day-to-day -day basis are those that are raised on the doorstep. And my understanding is that the money is available and it should be being spent now. Yeah. Joanna Cherry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the Scottish case, which has established that Article 50, or the Prime Minister's Article 50 notice, can indeed be revoked, the UK Government has lost three times in the Supreme Court of Scotland, in the UK Supreme Court, and yesterday in the Advocate General's opinion in the Court of Justice of the European Union. Can the Prime Minister tell us why she has put so much public money and so much energy into depriving this Parliament of legal certainty about the options which will be open to it when her deal is voted down next week. Minister! Can I, can I say to the Honourable Lady that this is, uh, this is an issue on which both the UK Government and actually the European Commission felt that it was right that this issue be tested. Uh, we will not revoke Article 50. That is, that is, that is, that is clear. The Government will not revoke Article 50. And I think everybody in this House needs to understand what the judgment of the Advocate General 
which, if past experience is anything to go by, the court will uh, uh, you know, go with, uh, but it still hasn't come to its final decision. But if the advice of the Advocate General is, uh, if his determination is, does go ahead, what it says is that it is possible for a country unilaterally to revoke Article 50, but that isn't about extending Article 50, it's about making sure that we don't leave the European Union. That's what, that's what that judgment is about. We will not revoke Article 50. The British people voted to leave the European Union and we will be leaving. All Scully. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A number of members of this House and members of the public are still concerned that we may risk being in an extended, if not permanent, backstop situation or customs territory. Can my right honourable friend explain why, in her opinion, the European Union won't want this to exist and that we could, they, they will negotiate in good faith for an extensive free trade agreement? Minister. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. I recognise there are concerns about the backstop. But it is indeed the case that it is not attractive for the European Union to have the United Kingdom in the backstop uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, the European Union, we will not be accepting free movement, uh, at the, and therefore, and there will be very light touch level playing field requirements. These are matters which mean that the European Union does not see this as an, uh, as an, attractive, uh, as an attractive place for them to put the UK. They think that's an attractive place for the UK to be in, and they won't want us to be in it for any longer than is necessary. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The European Structural Fund is worth billions to Scotland, and funds initiatives in my constituency of North Ayrshire and Arran, such as tackling <coughs> poverty and promoting social inclusion. This is to be replaced by the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. However, we have no real detail or clarity as to how this fund will be designed or when it will begin. Why not? Yeah. It is Prime Minister. Place by a shared prosperity fund, which will be looking at ensuring that we are dealing with disparities which exist uh, between communities and between nations, and the government will be consulting before the end of the year. And Derek Thomas. Hey. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Next week will be the first opportunity for MPs to vote on the withdrawal agreement, and I was glad to have the opportunity to speak to the debate last night. Should the withdrawal agreement not secure the support of Parliament, can my friend the Prime Minister assure this House and my constituents that Her Majesty's Government will seek early dialogue with negotiators in Brussels to seek to address the genuine concerns of MPs across the House? Yeah. Prime Minister. My honourable friend, I, I believe that the deal we have negotiated is a good deal. I recognise that concerns have been raised, particularly around the backstop, and that is an issue which, as I said yesterday in, the, uh, in my speech in the debate, I'm continuing to listen to colleagues on that uh, and considering the way forward. And Nick Smith. Yeah. Mr Speaker, one of my constituents has lost thousands of pounds from his British Steel pension as he was preyed upon by a rogue financial advisor. It's happened to hundreds of others across the country. The Financial Conduct Authority doesn't have the teeth to sort this out. I think ripping off pensioners is criminal. Does the Prime Minister agree? Yeah. Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that I'm very sorry to hear of the case of his constituent in relation to his, uh, to his pension and the, uh, the actions of that financial adviser, uh, and I will ensure that the Treasury uh, look at this issue of the Financial Conduct Authority in these sorts of cases. Uh, Vicky Ford! Yes. Yes. Speaker, our country's children are our country's future, and yesterday Ofsted reported that 90 95% of early years providers are now ranked good or outstanding, yeah, 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 yeah. up from 74% six years ago. Excellent. So will the Prime Minister join me in thanking all those who work in early years organisations for giving our children the very best start in their lives? Prime Minister. I, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend that the early years education is important. It's it, uh, important for children to give them that good start in life. I think it is a matter to be welcomed and, and applauded. The fact that we now have 95% of those providers uh, ranked of, of children in uh, good or outstanding provision of early years, and we should thank all those who are working in early years provision for the excellent work they are doing for our children and their future. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This morning's legal advice refers to the backstop as permanent arrangement and will endure indefinitely, a repeat of previous assertions that were made. Does the Prime Minister agree at this last moment 
that the entire premise of the backstop has been based on a false assertion. It is a practical, physical, political impossibility under any circumstances for a hard border to emerge on the island of Ireland. Why has she allowed that to be used as a negotiating ploy by the EU against the United Kingdom? Prime Minister. Honourable gentlemen, this is not a negotiating ploy by the European Union against the UK. What it is, is our commitment as a UK government to the people of Northern Ireland. He says that the political assertion that there will be no hard border is sufficient to give people reassurance for the future. I say no. What people want to know is that arrangements will be in place. It doesn't have to be the backstop. The future relationship will deal deal with this. The extension of the implementation period could deal with the temporary period. Alternative arrangements could deal with it. But people need to know. People need to know it is beyond a political assertion that there is that commitment there to the people of Northern Ireland to ensure that we have no hard border. Blackman. Mr Speaker, uh, yesterday London students heard from the renowned Holocaust survivor Hannah Lewis. She described the horrors of Europe's darkest hour. And as we celebrate the festival of Hanukkah, does my right honourable friend agree with me there could be no better place for the National Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre that alongside this Palace of Westminster as a permanent memorial to the horrors of the ultimate of anti-Semitism. Prime Minister. Can I uh, commend Hannah for the uh, contribution that she is making and has made over the years in bringing home to people the absolute (laughs) horrors of the Holocaust? Can I commend the work of the Holocaust Education Trust, which I think does important work up and down our country? But I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. I think there is no better place for the Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre to be than right next to our Parliament. And what is important is that this is not just a memorial. It is a learning centre. It will be about educating young people and others about the horrors of man's inhumanity to man. Liz Savile Roberts. I would like to take the opportunity to express my respect to Sammy Woodhouse for her courage as well. Yesterday, the National Assembly of Wales became the first Parliament on the British Isles to reject the Prime Minister's deal. What's clear, Mr Speaker, is it won't be the last. Wales has seen through how she is intent on inflicting GBH, her government's Brexit harm, on our nation. Beset on all sides, will the Prime Minister come to her senses and rule out a no-deal scenario before this House forces her to do so? If the Honourable Lady is concerned about the possible effects of a no-deal scenario, the only way to ensure that there is not a no-deal scenario is to accept a deal scenario and accept the deal that's on the table. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, the legal witch hunting of military veterans, which is something I've been raising with you, I think, for around a year now, is getting worse. The latest victim is David Griffin, a 77 year old former Royal Marine, who is being reinvestigated for an incident that took place in Northern Ireland 45 years ago and for which he was thoroughly cleared at the time. And they knew where to find him, Prime Minister because he is an in-pensioner at the Royal Hospital in Chelsea. How is it we live in a country where alleged IRA terrorists are given letters of comfort and we go after Chelsea pensioners instead? Prime Minister, this nonsense must stop. Please, please do something about it. Can I say to my right honourable friend, obviously he raises uh, a particular case which will have touched everybody across this, uh, across this House. But he also raises the contrast of the treatment of veterans with, the, uh, with terrorists. Uh, the, uh, around 3,500 people were killed in the Troubles. 90% of those were murdered by terrorists. And many of these cases require further investigations, including actually the deaths of hundreds of members of the security forces. What we have done is committed to establishing new mechanisms for dealing with this. in a balanced and proportionate way. We are concerned that what we see at the moment 
is a situation where there has been, I believe, a disproportionate uh, emphasis on those who are either serving military or indeed police officers at the time. I want to ensure that the terrorists are investigated and uh, we continue to look at this question. We've consulted on it. We'll be responding to that consultation. I recognise the strength of feeling in, from my honor, right honourable friend and others in relation to this issue and the Government will be responding in due course. Thank you. Finally, Louise Haig. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr Speaker. Yeah. I know the whole House is inspired by the bravery of Sammy Woodhouse in speaking out so that we can drive real change and horrified by the news that the man who raped Sammy and is serving a 35-year prison sentence was encouraged to seek access to her child through the family courts. Does the Prime Minister agree that no man who has fathered a child through rape should have parental rights yes. and will she seek to amend the legislation yeah. through the courts and tribunal bill when it comes back to this house yeah. so that men who have fathered children through rape cannot weaponise the courts yeah. to access children yeah. and re-traumatise their victims all over yeah. again. Yeah. Well, this is, this is obviously a very distressing case and I'm sure, as, as has just been heard, the concerns of the whole House rest with Sammy Woodhouse and rest with, with, with what has happened in this case. And as the facts have been reported, I'm sure we all of us consider it absolutely extraordinary that this should have happened in the first place. What is important is that the Ministry of Justice and other departments are urgently looking and working with local authorities on the issues that are raised in this case to ensure that there is a process in, in place in future that does protect children and, mother, and the child and mothers from, from harm. I understand I understand the Honourable Lady has met my Honourable Friend, the Parliamentary Under Secretary at the Minister of Justice, and I would urge her to continue engaging with the Ministry of Justice on this very important issue. Thank you. Order. <laughs> we will come to the Right Honourable Lady and her point of order ere long, but I think that she should have an attentive audience. An attentive audience, and that might not be possible if there's too much noise. So we'll just give it a moment. And then we'll hear the Right Honourable Lady. Sorry. Thank you, Mark. Point of order, Anna Subri. Is it in order that when you quite properly point out uh, a, member, somebody, a, a citizen of this country who has done a remarkably courageous thing like Sammy Woodhouse, we all want to support her and we all want to applause. But the only reason on these benches there wasn't applause, there was applause as well in the public gallery, is because of the conventions of the House. Yeah, yeah. And, and we really do, may I suggest, need to sort this out because it's not a sign of disrespect or lack of support yeah. here. Yeah. It's merely the convention, Mr Speaker, and I think it needs to be recorded. And as a House, we need to sort this out. Well, well, I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Lady for her point of order. I hadn't known that that was what she was intending to raise, and I couldn't have known because whatever other merits I have, I'm not psychic. <laughs> uh, but I do now know uh, what she's got in mind. And my response to that is to say that I have sought to demonstrate, uh, to exhibit flexibility in this matter. In other words, when it is obviously a spontaneous reaction in the House, and in particular of a non-partisan character, I think the Chair is very much inclined to be accommodating of that. When a political party engages in what might be called orchestrated clapping, in defiance of the convention of the House, and really in celebration of a party point, that is inappropriate, and the Chair deprecates it. I think it would have been different in this situation. So this Speaker, who has not in exactly been a slave to convention, I think the Right Honourable Lady will agree, all sorts of conventions have been adjusted and situations evolve in accordance with changing mores within the House, this Speaker would seek to be flexible. I think the Right Honourable Lady has registered the fact that members on the government benches wish to extend a very warm welcome to Sammy Woodhouse, yeah, yeah. as did people on the opposition benches. I think that feeling, as far as I can tell, was universally exhibited yeah, yeah. across the House. Thank you. If there are no further points of order, uh, we come now to the 10-minute rule motion. Uh, Tulip Sadiq. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill that makes provision for a time limit of 28 days 
for detention under the Immigration Act 1970 and other connected purposes. I realise that I have chosen to make my first 10-minute rule bill in a very quiet week in Parliament, but I hope that colleagues across the House will indulge me as I speak about a campaign that I'm very passionate about and is very close to my heart. I'm proud to be an MP for a constituency that has a proud history of welcoming immigrants. My constituency has a long history of welcoming economic migrants from Ireland or welcoming refugees that were fleeing political persecution in Nazi Germany. And at this moment in time, my constituency has 22,000 EU nationals who form the very fabric of our community. And I'm proud that both the councils in my constituency recently welcomed refugees from Syria and Somalia. And in fact, my mother came here as a political asylum seeker in the 1970s and settled in the very constituency that I'm now proud to represent here in Westminster. And I'm sure members from across the House will agree with me that we're very proud of the fact that Britain is a safe haven for people who can't go back to their country of origin. But there is a practice of indefinitely detaining people in our country that blights the nation and that we should all be ashamed of. We are the only country in the EU that indefinitely detains people, and we are one of the few countries in the world that indefinitely detains people. There are immigration officers who go around in the middle of the night capturing people and putting them in prison-like cells. Many of people across the House would have gone and visited these detention centres and know the conditions in which these people are kept in. In this country, we have legislation that means that if you are a terror suspect or a criminal suspect, you have a limit for how long you can be detained. If you are a terror suspect, you can be detained without charge for 14 days. If you are a criminal suspect, you can be detained without charge for 28 days. But we do not afford that same protection to refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants who should put us to shame. And the people who are detained, they range from nurses to doctors to teachers to students. Some of them have no criminal convictions before and have come here to seek economic opportunity. Some of them are former offenders who have served their term and then have come here to make a life for themselves anew. There are people who have come here because they have gone through insufferable trauma at their country of origin and have come here because it is a safe haven for them. Many are men, some are women, some are children. But above all, they are human, and detaining them indefinitely is a, is a blight on their human rights of freedom. People across the House who have gone to detention centres will know what these detention centres are like. You are ripped away from your families in the middle of the night, put in bare cells with no resource to legal advice to know when you are going to come out. Unfortunately, cases of abuse and neglect are commonplace. But when Red Cross interviewed some of these detainees and asked them what was the very worst thing about being detained, Emmanuel said the very worst thing was knowing, not knowing when he was going to be released. He knew the thought of there was no time limit for how long he was going to be in that cell is what caused such mental trauma and caused mental health problems. A similar detainee talked to Red Cross about how She had no light at the end of the tunnel because she knew this could go on forever. It's something that should shame us all. Being in detention forever comes to a problem where mental health issues have meant that there have been 600 cases where medical assistance has been needed to treat people because they've suffered and gone on to self-harm. It's led to an epidemic of suicide and self-harm across our detention centres. It's got to the point where, when Amnesty and Red Cross interviewed people, they said that nearly all of them had witnessed some form of suicide or some form of self-harm or desperation because they've been stuck in those cells for so long. And the worst thing for me is that people are not detained because of the criminal justice system. They're detained because of an inefficient administrative process, which insiders themselves have admitted could be sped up and only take weeks rather than months. This is what should make us even more embarrassed. The Home Office guidance says that you should be detained for a reasonable amount of time. 
I would like to ask the House, at one point does the House think it's reasonable to detain someone for over two years, which is what happens on a regular basis? Or the fact that one-fifth of detainees spend time in cells for over two months at a time, at what point does that become reasonable or unreasonable? When this has been talked about, whether we should have a 28-day limit, a lot of people have objected. For those who object and are not taken in by my arguments about it being cruel or inhumane, let's think about the cost and how inefficient the system actually is. The system at the moment is wholly insufficient for our time, but also hugely costly. Let the House just reflect on these figures, Mr. Speaker. It costs £86 a day for someone to be detained. In a year, it costs £34,000 for everyone that is detained at the moment. And Matrix evidence said that if we actually imposed a time limit and got people out when they were meant to be out, we would be saving £344 million in cost savings over a five-year period. So for those of you, who are, for those of those members who are not being taken in by the emotional argument, think about the amount of money that could be saved if we actually had a proper time limit on detention. Furthermore, the policy at the moment seems to be detain first, ask questions later. Perhaps if we had a time limit, then the immigration officers who go around could ask the questions, tackle this in a more sensitive way, and then detain later. It may also curb the cruel practice of mistaken detention, which happened with two people from the Windrush generation last year. The Home Secretary has said that the 28 days limit on detention is based on slogans rather than evidence. This is not based on slogans. This is a cry that has come from report after report, committee after committee, investigation after investigation. The APPG for Refugees has called for it. The select committees have called for it. Experts in the UN, in the EU, and international NGOs have called for it. My bill has been backed by liberty and by amnesty. And when I put forward this bill, I approached some unlikely names from the opposite <coughs> benches, and I was impressed with how quickly people came back and said they wanted to support this bill. I know for the last few months we've had huge division in the House, but I was actually inspired and reassured by the fact that ultimately we are all in this House because we want to make society a better place, and we want a more equal society in which the most vulnerable are protected. For us, we have to think about the history of our country. 800 years ago, in a field in Runnymede, the Magna Carta laid out our basic civil liberties. It talked about how you should not be imprisoned without due process and a fair trial. And now in this country, we have a criminal system which is not perfect, but it serves us well. There is one part in our legislation, in our criminal justice system, in our society, and generally in Parliament, where we have failed. We have absolutely failed to protect the most vulnerable because we allow them to be detained without any hope, without any reason, and without a light at the end of the tunnel. So I would say to the Home Secretary, there's no time for a review. We've been there. We've done the reviews. It is, this is about life and death. We need to act now. And this is why, imploring members from all across the House who have really indulged me in listening to my very long speech to say, please get together, please support me. Mr. Speaker, I'm asking for your support to make sure that we end this indefinite detention of the most vulnerable in society. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, far be it for me to argue, but the Honourable Lady hasn't made a long speech. She's made a speech absolutely within her rights and in conformity with the title. And the clue is in the title. It is called a 10-minute rule motion. And the Honourable Lady was within her time. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as I have that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? 
David Davis, Dominic Grieve, Dame Caroline Spellman, Andrew Mitchell, Paul Bloomfield, Lisa Nandy, Lila Moran, Rishnara Ali, Christine Jardine, David Lamy, Stella Creasy, and myself. Well done, Julie. Great speech. Tulip Siddiq. Immigration time limit on detention bill. Second reading what day? 25th January 2019. 25th of January 2019. Thank you. Order. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Section 13.1b of the European Union Withdrawal Bill Act 2018. Adjourn debate on question. Now. Uh, the question is as on the order paper. Just before I ask the Secretary of State for the Home Department to open the continuation of the debate on behalf of the Government, I feel it is important that order. I feel it is important that members are aware of the correct protocol for today and for each of the remaining subsequent days in this overarching debate on the government's proposed deal. It is true that it is a debate essentially revolving around one subject. However, I should remind colleagues that there are wind-up speeches each day from the opposition and treasury benches, and the implication of that should be blindingly obvious to colleagues. And that is, if you speak in the debate, it is incumbent upon you to turn up at whatever hour the debate is concluded to hear the wind-up speeches. <coughs> Yesterday, I'm sorry to say, there were a number of examples of members who spoke, in some cases at considerable length in the debate, but who, on account, no doubt, of being very busy with many commitments and very full diaries, felt that they had to be elsewhere for the wind-up speeches. And I know, and I think it, would, it may well be widely accepted that the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition did not come for the wind-up of the debate, and personally I take no exception to that at all, but I think in every other case, it would have been marvellous to welcome them, but I quite understand why they couldn't be here, but in every other case, if you speak in the debate, please then do me the courtesy, or do the House the courtesy, of turning up for the wind-ups. And with that little homily uh, duly completed, I invite the Secretary of State for the Home Department, Sajid Javid, to continue the debate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's a great pleasure for me to open this debate. I can't think of a better way to celebrate my 49th birthday. <laughs> Surely not. Sure. The, the coming weeks will be one of the most defining political periods, not just of this Parliament or as our times as MP, but since the Second World War. I know that all honourable and right honourable members will have the national interests at the very forefront of their minds. Next Tuesday, we will be asked if we will support my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister's Brexit deal. Each one of us will have to make that decision. And it is my belief that the deal on the table is the best option available in ensuring a smooth exit from the European Union. It will ensure that we leave the EU as planned on the 29th of March next year that we take back control of our borders, end the jurisdiction of the ECJ in the UK, and we stop sending vast sums of money to Brussels. Yeah. The deal will have a significant uh, impact on two major areas of Home Office policy, that's security and immigration. I very happily take the uh, intervention from the Right Honourable Gentleman. And he's just mentioned about taking back control and ending the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. I presume he has 
seen the legal advice published today by, from the Attorney General, which makes it clear that, in fact, that is not the case in terms of the backstop, which he also says is indefinite, that Northern Ireland remains in the EU Customs Union, not in some kind of customs arrangement, and will apply the whole of the EU Customs Acquis, and the Commission and the European Court of Justice will continue to have jurisdiction over its compliance with those rules. Northern Ireland will treat Great Britain as a third country. How can he possibly stand here and recommend this deal and say that it brings to an end the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice and takes back control? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I, I very much uh, respect uh, what the right honourable gentleman has uh, just said, and he shared it with the House uh, uh, on, uh, on a few occasions, and I absolutely uh, understand that. And uh, let me just say from the outset, you know, no one can pretend that this deal is perfect in every sense. There was inevitably there will be some compromises uh, with this deal with a, a number of objectives, in, including, as we just heard uh, uh, j just very recently from the Prime Minister herself in Prime Minister's questions, a need to ensure that the uh, commitments in the Good Friday Agreement are upheld. What the right honourable gentleman is referring to, of course, is the if, if, and it is an if, if the backstop arrangement uh, kicks in, and he's right to point to the legal advice, but also uh, it is worth uh, keeping in mind that uh, that situation does not necessarily arise, even if there is no uh, um, uh, final uh, um, deal on the future arrangement by December 2020. There's an opportunity for alternative arrangements, including extending the implementation period. And even if then it, the, uh, what the right honourable gentleman referred to actually kicked in, the backstop arrangement, it is uh, even legally from the European Union's perspective, at a minimum, it is not sustainable because it's done under Article 50 um, of the European Union's own uh, rules. Uh, yeah, yes, I will. Would he not accept that if you're maintaining an open border where there's a land border, uh, that can only be done in a modern economy by having some form of customs union applying to both sides of the border? Uh, and unless and until someone else comes forward with an alternative way of timelessly guaranteeing an open border, the arrangement proposed is the only conceivable one that's possible for the foreseeable future until something better comes along. And really, this was quite obvious months ago, and it's quite futile to start protesting about it now. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, I always listen carefully to what my right honourable friend uh, has to say on all matters, and uh, it is, I think it's, it's, it is correct that this is one way to ensure, in that all-important border, completely frictionless trade. But I, I wouldn't accept it's the only way uh, to do this. And, and whilst it is uh, recognised in, uh, in the agreement uh, under the backstop arrangement that this is uh, a way that clearly has been uh, foreseen uh, by this agreement, uh, as I said a moment ago, I think there, there are potentially other ways uh, that uh, this can be uh, achieved, and it is right that we properly explore all possible alternative uh, arrangements. I will give way to the honourable gentleman. Rather than listen to the advice of the father of the house, would the Secretary of State listen to the advice of the Taoiseach of the Irish Republic, Mr Junkers and Michelle Barnier in the EU, and his own government, all of whom said, uh, have said that in the event of no deal or any other kind of deal, they would not impose a hard border That's on right. the, the, the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. So quite clearly it must be possible yes. to do this, despite uh, the, uh, the comments of the That's father the of the House. Line. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what the uh, honourable gentleman uh, highlights that it is important to, to listen to uh, all voices, uh, and, I, and I think again it points to whilst this is a arrangement, it's right that we look and continue to explore to see whether there are other arrangements uh, as well that can lead to a more permanent and more easily acceptable uh, outcome. So, Mr. Uh, I, will, I will give way one more time that I do need to make some progress, and I will come back. Is likely to enable the UK lawfully to exit the UK-wide customs union without a subsequent agreement. It goes on to say, 
This remains the case even if parties are still negotiating many years later, and even if The parties believe that talks have clearly broken down and there is no prospect of a future relationship agreement. Doesn't that undermine the point he made a moment ago exactly. when he argued that this arrangement was not sustainable in the long term because yes. of the limitations exactly. of Article 50? Exactly. The advice of the Attorney General is it's going to last. Uh, for his comments, and, but he might also what the Attorney General said at this dispatch box uh, earlier this week. And the Attorney General made it clear then, what naturally he is providing is a legal analysis, but this should also be seen in the context of the, of the politics of such a situation. And uh, the Attorney General uh, set out that quite clearly as well on the day, and uh, I refer him to the remarks the Attorney General had made on that earlier this week. I will give away one more time to my right on the Very grateful to the Home Secretary. Will he confirm that the withdrawal agreement means that the UK will have to pay a lot of money for many years after we have left the European Union if we sign it, that there are no cash limits or numbers in the document, very general heads, and that the EU would have preponderant power in deciding just how vast this open-ended commitment will be, which will be massively more than £39 billion. Uh, what I'll say to my uh, right honourable friend is that in the withdrawal agreement, it's, it's, there is an estimated uh, amount that the UK will pay. Uh, it won't be instant, it is over a, a number of years, but there is an estimated amount. And uh, the, the general number uh, that has been uh, talked of by government ministers uh, and others uh, is a, a total of £39 billion. Pounds. Uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy, uh, I, I, must, I, must, I will come back, back to the Honourable Lady in a, in a moment. I will do that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Home Office uh, is uh, affected in two significant areas in terms of uh, uh, this deal, and that's security and immigration. So today I would like to set out uh, what it is that is on offer in these two important areas and why I think it is in the interests of the United Kingdom. So let me first start with uh, security. The Brexit deal negotiated by the Prime Minister delivers the solid foundation we need for future security cooperation with our European partners. It avoids a cliff edge by providing for an implementation period ensuring a smooth transition from current arrangements to a new strong partnership. A, an unplanned no-deal Brexit would mean an immediate and probably indefinite loss of some security capability, which despite our best efforts would likely cause some operational disruption when we leave. And as, I will in a moment, and as Home Secretary, I know which option I would prefer. I have seen firsthand how important it is to have a strong security partnership with our European allies, and I have seen the potential dangers that kind of cooperation uh, prevents and the security and the safety that it ensures. Oh, give way. What he says about no deal is right. But the Chancellor has earned some respect for showing a level of candour this week that there is an economic trade off by any, with any form of, of Brexit. Will he be similarly open with the House and the public that there is going to be some form of security trade off? over Brexit to achieve the, the aims that the Brexiteers want? Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentile, I would appoint him first to uh, an analysis that we published in quite some detail just last week, an assessment of uh, security uh, arrangements that are in this uh, deal. And you know, whilst I accept that the security arrangements uh, with this deal will be different, inevitably they will be different, of course, will be a third country outside the EU, what we uh, have here, I think we can safely say, is the most comprehensive security agreement the EU has with any third country. I'll give way. The former Home Office Minister. Some time in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee recently on the subject of database access. Uh, yesterday, the Prime Minister was questioned by a fellow member of the Home Affairs Select Committee from Cardiff South and Penarth on the question of whether CIS 2 is included in the agreement. The Prime Minister stated that they were referred to in the political agreement. In section 86 of the political agreement, it only refers to PNR 
and PRUM, not CIS2, a vital database. Can he now put the House straight as to exactly what the situation is with those databases? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, will, I, I thank my honourable friend uh, for that uh, question, and, and I will very happily do that. What the agreement uh, refers to, I don't have the exact paragraph in front of me, but in terms of uh, the, the, the CIS2 databases, the wanted and missing persons uh, uh, database, and uh, there's also another uh, database, the, uh, the, the agreement refers to in a similar vein, which is a database on criminal records, European criminal records. And the uh, agreement says that we will consider cooperation uh, on those databases, but it does not guarantee it. Uh, I will. Secretary, for giving way. Could he point me to the pages in this document that he has published which give guarantees on our membership of Europol, on our membership of Eurojust, and our continued membership of the European Arrest Warrant? Because, as a former Home Office Minister as I am, I can tell him they are critical to the safety of our citizens and they are absent from this document. Well, uh, uh, I thank the honourable gentleman. And um, in the agreement, it clearly refers to uh, mutual exchange of data, both on uh, passenger names and uh, records, on DNA, on fingerprints, on vehicle registrations, on fax, fast track for extradition. Something I'll cover in a moment in my speech, and uh, also continued cooperation with Europol and with Eurojust. I, I must make some uh, progress, Mr. I, I will give way to the Right Honourable Lady. I'm grateful to the Home Secretary for giving way. I just wanted to, to clarify his answer because as I cannot find anywhere in the political declaration any reference to CIS2. Can he confirm there is no reference to CIS2 anywhere in this document? I'm very happy to give him my copy if he doesn't have a copy with him. Um, and in paragraph 86, as my uh, uh, as the honourable member for the, uh, was also on the select committee referred to, only refers to passenger name record and the uh, PRUM databases. It does not refer to CIS2. Can he be clarify for the House there is no reference to CIS2 in the declaration? Well, um, I, I thank the uh, Right Honourable Lady for her question and also the, the focus she has brought to this in the uh, Select Committee uh, as well, including uh, recently. It, um, just, just to be clear, the, the, there is no claim that the document itself refers to the databases CIS2 or the ECRIS database uh, for that matter. Uh, what the document talks about is uh, considering continued cooperation on uh, those, uh, the kind of information that is in those databases and that it will be properly considered to see if there is a way to continue that type of cooperation. I will give way to her one more time. She is the chair of the Select Committee. I am grateful for him to doing so because that paragraph 87 refers to considering further arrangements and arrangements that might approximate those enabled by relevant union mechanisms. Well, the CIS2 database has 76 million pieces of information on it. There's no sign that anybody is going to create another alternative database that has just as much information on it. So what on earth does it mean to talk about approximating access to the CIS2 database? Either we get access to it or we don't. Well, I, what I would say to the right honourable lady is what it means is exactly what it says in paragraph 87, which is that we will consider further arrangements that will, that will help the exchange of information on wanted or missing persons and criminal records. And uh, the, the right honourable lady would be more aware than most people that in this House, given her interest in these matters, that we didn't join this database and, uh, until 2015 was the first time we joined this database. Before that, we were using either other database bases on wanted and missing persons, including the Interpol database. So there are also other pieces of data that we can use for this type of information, but I think it's good that we've got an outcome here that we will consider further cooperation on exactly this kind of important information. I, I will. Yeah. Very grateful to my right honourable friend for giving way. For all the concern that's being expressed by colleagues on both sides of the House, is the Home Secretary aware of a single Interior Minister or Security Agency Chief around the whole of the EU that actually wants to reduce the level of cooperation that the UK currently has with the EU and the countries within? It's a, it's a, it's a very good intervention my honourable friend uh, makes. 
in, in all my discussions uh, with uh, interior ministers on security cooperation, there is not a single one I have come across that wants to reduce security cooperation, and every single one rec- uh, understands uh, that the mutual benefit that comes about through continued cooperation and information exchange. Now, Mr. Speaker, the deal the UK has reached with the EU will provide for the broadest and the most comprehensive security relationship the EU has ever had with another country. This agreement allows for our relationship to include various important areas of cooperation, continuing the work closely together on law enforcement and criminal justice, keeping people safe in the UK, across Europe and around the world through exchanging information on criminals and tackling terrorism, ensuring that we can investigate and prosecute those suspected of serious crime and terrorism, supporting international efforts to prevent money laundering and counter-terrorist financing, combating new and evolving threats such as cyber security. It also allows us for joint working for joint working on wider security issues, including asylum and illegal migration. The declaration also sets out that we should carry on sharing significant data and processes such as, I will in a moment, such as passenger name records so that we can continue disrupting criminal networks involved in terrorism, serious crime and modern slavery, on DNA, fingerprint and vehicle registration data, ensuring law enforcement agencies can quickly investigate and prosecute criminals and terrorists. Fast track extradition to bring criminals to justice quickly where they've committed a crime and as well as continued cooperation with Europol and Eurojust. I will give way to the honourable gentleman. Wish list. And it's all in the political declaration, but it's no more deliverable than a letter to Santa Claus. It really isn't. Because there's no settled policy on extradition, there's no settled policy in a legal definition that could be delivered through the law courts on any of these elements. And the, this is, the proof of this is that the government hasn't even got an immigration policy. It's all very well having a wish list, but how on earth could a serious member of parliament? Vote for nothing more than a wish list. Well, when it comes to leaving the EU, Mr. Speaker, the only wish list I'm aware of that's worth nothing are Labour's so called six six principles. Uh, that's, the, that's the wish list that the Honourable Gentleman has continually supported and supported again and again. But when it comes to this actual deal, and especially on security cooperation, you, for example, there is an agreement on mutual exchange of data, on passenger name records, on DNA, on fingerprints, on vehicle registrations, and on fast track extradition. He should go and explain to his constituents how important that is to them. I will give way to the Honourable Lady. Secretary. Can he confirm that if we are out of the European arrest warrant and unable to put any other identical arrangement in place, there are a number of countries that will be unable in future under their own constitution to extradite their nationals to this country? I can say, first to the uh, Honourable Lady, that we, we're not going to have an identical uh, way to, uh, for extradition in the future because there's no need for an identical way. We will be outside the European Union, no longer a member, so it is not appropriate that we are members of the current exact mechanism, the European Arrest Warrant, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue to cooperate with an agreement with the EU on fast and expeditious extradition procedures and fast track extradition and it's in the agreement it's been agreed. No, I, I, I will not. I do have to make some progress. Now, Mr Speaker, when it comes to external threats, we will be able to have an ambitious partnership also on foreign policy, security and defence, which will enable both sides to combine efforts for the greatest impact. And it allows for ongoing cooperation on other important cross-cutting issues, including countering violent extremism and the spread of infectious diseases. Of course, there is some further work to be done to ensure that we build on the foundation that this deal provides. This is not about uh, wanting to stay close to the EU and its security arrangements just for the sake of it. We are leaving and our relationship must change. This is about a hard-headed, pragmatic, evidence-based decision on what is the best security interest of the UK. I I will give way. Secretary, confirm that because we won't be participating in the PESCO arrangements, that we will have no seat in the room, no voice, and no vote or veto within 
any of the foreign policy, defence and security arrangements. We won't be in the European Defence Agency and we won't be unless we have a special arrangement with the European Defence Fund. What is the point of that in terms of increasing yeah, yeah, our yeah. security? Yeah. <laughs> Mr Speaker, what I'd say gently to the honourable gentleman, of course, when we've left the EU, we won't be participating as direct members in, in the, uh, those kinds of uh, foreign and security um, tools. Uh, we will have our own independent foreign and defence policy, and we will have the ability, if we choose to, to align ourselves with the EU. And the honourable gentleman should also remember, because it is worth uh, recalling in this House, that our security is underpinned across Europe for our membership of NATO, not membership of the European Union. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, security, uh, Mr. Speaker, ultimately I believe that the DS this deal it strikes the right balance, and we will keep Britain one of the safest countries in the world. I would also like to, uh, to I would also like to turn now to the consequences for security of no deal. An uncooperative no deal would have an impact on protecting the public. There will be no implementation period smoothing our transition into these new arrangements. The UK would have to stop using EU security tools and data platforms from March next year. There will be unhelpful implications for our law enforcement agencies and border guards. There would be disruption and they would have less information available to do their jobs, including identifying and arresting people who could threaten the security of some of our citizens. They would have fewer options for pursuing criminals across borders, as we would lose the ability to pool our efforts through Europol and Eurojust. And it would take longer to track, arrest and to bring to justice those who commit crimes internationally. I have established, I will in a moment, I, I will in a moment, I, Mr Speaker, I have established and I chair a weekly COBRA-style planning meeting within the Home Office to plan for this properly in case this eventuality comes about. But no matter how effectively we prepare for a no deal, setting aside the capabilities we have developed with, the EU, with our EU partners will of course have some consequences. I will give way. Secretary is uh, getting on with his speech, but I have been listening very intently. He has really, really given me the assurance I want on Europol. And can I give a last chance in his speech just to mention Galileo? <laughs> Well, the, the, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman says he's been listening very carefully. I do doubt it, because I think I have uh, given him and Honourable Members assurance about the security implications of this deal, what security situation may look like if there's uh, no deal. But it, it is clear to me, you know, we are lucky to live in one of the safest countries in the world, and uh, with this deal, we will continue to be one of the safest countries. And of course, even if there is, even if there is no deal, there are some mitigants. There's no perfect mitigant at all. We will lose certain tools that we certainly uh, would, uh, would have been helpful from a security perspective. But whatever happens, Britain will continue to be one of the safest countries in the world. I will give way to... I uh, thank my right honourable friend for giving way. <coughs> um, is, is he aware that... One of the problems with the withdrawal agreement, whatever he has said, is that state aid provisions would prevent the government uh, from subsidising or supporting our defence industries in the same way as the EU can and as we currently can under the EU treaties. And is that not a, a serious risk to our national security, which the government has failed to take into account? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I've listened to my uh, honourable friend uh, uh, carefully. You know, I, I have uh, yet to see uh, uh, so far in terms of, of course, there's those EU state rule, aid rules uh, apply to the UK uh, at the moment, and they will indeed through the implementation uh, period. I've yet to see uh, how that has a detrimental impact on our security apparatus and supply. But given that my honourable friend has raised this question, it is uh, worth looking at more closely. And if he allows me, I will do so and get back to him. And uh, I will. Is he giving us a completely false choice by saying it's either this deal or no deal, particularly um, in the decision that we made regarding the decision we made yesterday in this House uh, uh, that uh, clearly allows us as a House to choose different options than just this deal or no deal? Isn't this a false choice that he's giving us? No, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's not. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, 
Right. I would uh, now like to turn to the other uh, big issue uh, for the Home Office regarding this deal, which is uh, immigration. Now, concerns over immigration were a key factor in how people voted in the referendum in 2016. People wanted control over immigration. They wanted future decisions on UK immigration policy to be taken in this country and by this Parliament. That is what this, I will in a moment, that is what this deal delivers. The deal will allow us to create an immigration system that is not constrained by EU laws and which works only in the national interest. Free movement will end. In future, the decision on who comes to the UK will rest with the UK itself and not with individual migrants. The UK will continue to be an open and welcoming country that attracts the best talent from across the world. I will give way to my honour, the honourable gentleman. Very grateful, to be given way. Um, can, I, can I just impress upon him again the acute problems that there have been in fishing on the west coast of Scotland and indeed in Northern Ireland? And I don't know how many numerous meetings I've had with various government ministers. They come and they go over the time. But would he look next year to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Now we're making sure we're getting crews on boats and we make sure that non-EE labour are coming in. The problem is going to get worse with the situation we have at the moment. The Home Secretary has it in his gift. It's not Europe that's stopping him. It's in his gift. He can lift the pen. This will happen. He will be thanked and appreciated across the west coast of Scotland if he does that. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm always very happy to listen to honourable members and indeed I've met many of the Conservative uh, Scottish members of this uh, House who have made, uh, uh, made uh, that point in a very powerful uh, way and so we are listening. I think if it's, uh, it think can be fairly said what the honourable gentleman is referring to is uh, issues that I believe he has uh, currently here and now, whereas I, I, I do want to focus uh, for this uh, debate on the, the future immigration system. I, I, I will give way to the right honourable gentleman. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Home Secretary for giving way, and he is absolutely right to say that concerns about immigration were at the forefront of many of the reasons people cited for voting to leave. Therefore, is it not extraordinary that ultimately we do not know what the immigration policy and stance of this country would be after March? It necessarily will be interrelated with a future economic relationship. We have no certainty on that. We do not know what it will be. And he has not published his immigration bill. So how does anyone know before this vote what they will be getting on immigration in this withdrawal agreement, ultimately? I, I, where I agree with the honourable gentleman is that, is that uh, first, I think we agree that immigration was a big issue in the referendum debate. Uh, second, that a, the what type of immigration system we have uh, in the future, of course, will have an impact on our economic uh, performance. Um, uh, but I have, uh, in terms of what that system might look like, and uh, I know he will be listening carefully for the, uh, for, to the rest of this uh, uh, debate, but I'll give more information on what that uh, might look like. Uh, that it, it, we, we are setting out uh, the sort of broad principles of the new system, and we will be publishing a white paper which will have much more. We, we will be publishing a white paper soon. 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 Yes, we will publish soon. And, uh, and I know, uh, I, Mr. Mr. I will in a moment. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I know the uh, honourable members are opposite in particular, are very eager for this white paper. They don't have to wait long. And, and when that white, it's also worth keeping in mind that when that white paper is published, that is uh, not the end of the conversation. Like all white papers, it is uh, essentially the start of a broad consultation that will last for many weeks, where we'll be able to speak to many uh, businesses and others and honourable and right honourable members. And uh, that will be, and that will be a moment where we can set out in much more detail. I will give way to my honourable friend. Extremely grateful to my right honourable friend. Um, speaking as a Brexiteer, somebody who campaigned for Brexit, can I say that the most important determinant was sovereignty, sovereignty of this place. So, and as part of that, clearly sovereignty did decide our own immigration, control our borders, etc. Can he give an indication that the future immigration policy, because uh, um, we're not against immigration, we want controlled immigration, can he assure us that it will be non-discriminatory as far as the world is concerned? I, I can absolutely give my honourable friend that assurance, and I, I absolutely agree with the, 
with the, all the points uh, that he's just made there, including the importance of control of our immigration policy. I'll give way to my right honourable friend. He and, I, he and I both served in the cabinet of the previous Prime Minister, and he will recall that uh, he tried with the European Union to get a limitation on the access to welfare payments for those who have just arrived here. Uh, he did that without success. Now we have uh, left and we say we want to take back control. It's very vague in the political declaration. It talks about social security cooperation. Could he now tell me, is it our ambition to ensure that businesses can't bring people over, pay them very cheap wages, expect them then to claim benefits, and they then live in squalor conditions? Will we now rule out access to many of those benefits which cost a lot of money for people who come over to the, from the EU? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I agree very much with the uh, sentiment of what my right honourable friend has said, and, and, I, and I think that uh, it is fair to say that once we have left the EU, we have a lot more flexibility uh, in that area, and, uh, and the rules that we will pl apply, turning back to the question uh, just a, a moment before as well, uh, it, they will be non-discriminatory. We will apply the, the broad intention to apply the same rules to anyone, regardless of their nationality. We will be focused on on an individual's skills, what they have to offer, the contribution that they have to make, and uh, we will not want uh, welfare or uh, any other type of uh, um, social security payment to be part of a decision about whether someone wishes to come and uh, work in this country. And uh, when the white paper is set out, there will be more detail uh, on this. I will, I, I will give way to the right honourable lady, and then I'll come there. Thank you. I um, thank the uh, Home Secretary and also put in a word for the other member of the Select Committee as well, who is um, hoping to ask, catch your eye as well. The Home Secretary also uh, told us just eight days ago that the immigration white paper would certainly be published in December. Can he tell us is that still true? I can tell the uh, Honourable Lady that it is still, certainly it's still my intention to publish it in December, and that hasn't changed. I will give way. Grateful to the, I, I'm grateful to the Home Secretary for giving way, because what the Home Secretary said at the Home Affairs Select Committee was, and I quote, the meaningful vote is on the 11th, I hope it, the uh, white paper on immigration, will come before that. That was just last week, yet on Monday he said on the radio it was unlikely, actually very unlikely, to be published before the vote. What happened in those four or five days to change the Home Secretary's mind, and does he think it's acceptable that this House should vote on the withdrawal deal without the information in the white paper? I, I'd, I'd say two things uh, to my honourable friend, and it's a very full, fair point that he raises. I mean, the, the, the first is that you know, he asks what's happened, and it's just worth uh, reminding him and the House that this is the most significant change in our immigration system in 45 years. And rather than rush the white paper, it is important that we focus on the detail and we get it right and we get it out as soon as possible. And uh, the second point I'd make is that this white paper, of course, we should uh, think of our new immigration system as uh, part of our deal as we exit uh, from the European Union. But it is also uh, clear that if we have no deal, there will also still be a new immigration system. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is worth, uh, I think, uh, for honourable members to keep that in mind too. I will give way to the honourable lady who has been very patient. Thank you. Grateful to the Home Secretary for giving way. I just want to. Uh, disturb the slightly cosy consensus that was arising there between the Labour front bench and some on, on the, between the, the government front bench and some on the Labour back benches. Because of course the view on immigration in Scotland is different. Voters in Scotland don't want to reduce immigration. Yeah, yeah. Business, yeah, the universities, the financial yeah, sector, yeah, yeah, the fintech yeah, yeah. sector, the yeah. cyber security sector in my constituency are very keen not to reduce migration into Scotland. Is he aware of that and will he take that on board in his white paper? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think, therefore, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, the, the Honourable Lady will agree with, with what I have to say next, which is that immigration has been good for Britain. 
It has been. It has made us a, globe, a good hub for culture, for business, for travel, and it's boosted our economy and our society in countless ways. And it's, uh, that's as true for Scotland as it is for other parts of the United Kingdom. And that's why, from the very start of this process, uh, for example, this government's first priority, my first priority, has been to safeguard the position of the more than three million EU citizens that are currently living in the UK and the almost one million UK nationals living in the EU. The, I, I will come back in a moment. The withdrawal agreement guarantees the rights of EU citizens and their family members living in the UK and the UK nationals living in the EU. And my message on this has been very clear. EU citizens make a huge contribution to our economy and to our way of life. They are our friends, they are our colleagues, they are our neighbours, and we want we need and we want them to stay, regardless of whether there is a deal or there is no deal. And so, Mr Speaker, I can confirm that even in the event of no deal, EU citizens and their families living here in the UK before we leave will be able to apply to the EU settlement scheme and stay. And we will be setting more details on this out shortly. I will give way. That the Home Secretary will think about is it is not necessarily a, a win for British citizens to lose the right to travel, study and work elsewhere in the European Union. It has been something that has been vital to a whole generation of people in this country. But more importantly, he says he is going to change the system for um, uh, the, the immigration system. Is he still going to try and stick to this ludicrous proposal of getting net migration down to the tens of thousands? Yeah. Because even in the category where the government has been fully in control, which is in migration from other parts of the world outside the EU, that runs at more than 200,000 a year now. Absolutely. Will he please say now they're going to get rid of this yeah. nonsense? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the right honourable gentleman mentioned uh, students. Yeah, I, I, I welcome student exchange, and I want to see more students, whether they're from the EU or outside the EU, choosing uh, Britain as the place to study. And uh, we have been very clear that when it comes to students, for example, there is no cap on student numbers. We've seen actually in the last year we've seen a significant increase in student numbers from across the world, and that is just the type of country we want to remain, where we're welcoming people, especially uh, students and uh, others from uh, across the world, those that either want to study here, they want to uh, uh, they, uh, come here as tourists, or they uh, have skills contri to contribute that we actually need. I will give way to the Honourable Lady. Giving way. Of course, we, we don't just want the students to come here. We want them, particularly in Scotland, to stay here to contribute to our economy. And will the Home Secretary look at reinstating the post study work visa so that we're not educating young people from across the world simply to take the skills elsewhere and to feed other countries' economies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually I have some sympathy with what the honourable lady said, and interestingly, in the in the um, in a report that I'll mention in a moment, the Independent Mac report, it did talk about uh, looking at uh, some of the post-study work rights, and I'm actively I am doing that. We've got to be careful, though, that that those uh, post-study work rights don't in themselves become the reason for someone to choose to study in Britain. They must choose to study in Britain because of what our fantastic universities and other education establishments have to offer. But I think it is also sensible that when people are choosing to study in Britain and if they are taking uh, 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 qualifications uh, that are needed in our own economy, that we have a sensible approach that allows them to stay if it makes sense for us and to continue to contribute. I will give way. Go on, Lily. Yep. Understand what the Home Secretary was saying there about post-study work visas. Is he saying that we shouldn't deliberately try to attack, attract talent to the nations of these islands? Is that his position? That we shouldn't deliberately try to attract talent to the nations of these islands? Is that the government's position? I think, Mr. Speaker, I say that's the complete opposite of what I was saying. So either the, the lady misheard me, or uh, that is what she would like me to say, so she can open it up in some kind of press release or some kind of attack line. That is exactly what I didn't say. What I, what I am happy to, I'm happy to, no, I'm happy to make it clear that you know, I, I, I welcome students that choose Britain. And I think that we should take a fresh look at how we can retain talent 
that has chosen Britain to study to continue to work in Britain if it meets our economic needs. I will give way to my right honourable friend. More broadly, of universities, obviously, they rely on attracting the best academic talent to teach our students and international students. Can he just briefly set out whether his immigration paper will make sure it doesn't close doors to that? And reflecting on the fact that many of these professionals will not be highly paid, and often it's salaries that are taken to translate yeah, yeah. to skill levels, and in that case, and also in the case of performing arts, that does not hold. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I know that my right honourable friend speaks with a, a great deal of experience uh, in this area, and, uh, and she's absolutely right to point that out. They are in the, so our universities do rely on academic talent, and much of that comes uh, uh, from abroad, and that is to be welcomed. And we must have an immigration system that continues to do that, and we must take a careful look at the salary levels, as she's uh, just talked of. I'll uh, give way to my honourable friend. Further to my right honourable friend's point, will the Home Secretary commit to looking at the extra costs that will also fall and the bureaucracy that will fall to our health service and our care sector? And as my right honourable friend has said, because of the salary threshold that applies, so many of the really key staff that allow our health service and care sector to function will fall below that salary threshold. And the extra costs that will fall on the care sector in particular are quite extraordinary. Will he commit to reducing the bureaucracy and tackling that cost? Uh, Mr Speaker, it's a, again a very important point that's been raised uh, by my colleagues and uh, I can absolutely make that commitment. She's quite right to raise it because we have to recognise when you move from uh, the current system of uh, freedom of movement where there is virtually no bureaucracy to, to speak of to a system that we will require visas for every uh, worker, that we've got to uh, keep an eye on that, uh, any of the paperwork and uh, bureaucratic requirements and to keep it as simple and as light touch as possible, not just for larger employers such as uh, hospitals, uh, for example, NHS trusts, but also uh, in my mind are the smaller employers that, uh, that may be looking for skills but maybe just one or two people a year to keep that in our minds uh, as well. I'll give way to my honourable friend. Very grateful to the Home Secretary for giving away. Um, it's not just, of course, doctors and nurses in my constituency, an awful lot of those involved in agriculture and tourism uh, are concerned to ensure that a seasonal workforce continues to be readily available. So can the Home Secretary reassure that in his plans is a mechanism for allowing that sort of migration so that the needs of those very important industries in Somerset can be met? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I can give my honourable friend that assurance and uh, he will know that already uh, I have announced a, a pilot uh, for seasonal workers agricultural uh, scheme which we were starting uh, early next year and the purpose of that pilot uh, w working uh, with my right honourable friend the DEFRA secretary is to, uh, to make sure that we look carefully at how we can continue to meet the needs of that very important sector. I will give way one more time at this point to the right honourable gentleman. So, so, I thank the, I thank the Home Secretary for giving away. I'm sure the Home Secretary real, realises that there's 800,000 people in this country actually work in the automobile industry, and therefore it's very important we get the specialist labour that facilitates research and development, and that involves the universities, and not very much has been said in relation to Brexit about the plight of the universities as if it's not handled properly. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman is quite right to highlight the importance of our automobile industry and uh, the, the need for skills, particularly in areas such as uh, engineering. And uh, the, uh, I, I can give an assurance that we will want to make sure that the new immigration system allows for these uh, vital skills uh, where they are needed. I will just give away one more time at this point to the Honourable Gentleman. Will you confirm that in the case of a no deal, there will be an immediate hard border in Northern Ireland to stop the passage of people and products, and in the event of a, of a deal, then people will just be able to fly into Dublin and walk into the UK via Northern Ireland? Uh, Mr Speaker, what I can confirm is that you know, no... Uh, no one wants a, a, a no deal, but in the event of a no deal, the UK government would not do anything to create a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, 
It is uh, unrestricted immigration that has uh, caused uh, some people some concerns. It will shortly, uh, as I said earlier, I will shortly be bringing forward a white paper which will set out the proposals for the future immigration system. I do. Well, it, it's lovely to be out and...